You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rockin' tunage means it's time for the rockin'est show in the world of options. Yes, it's time for the option block. My name is Mark Longo from the old optionsinsider.com. Head on over there if you haven't been over there in a while. It's fun. We like it. I think you're going to like it too. Lots of good stuff. Lots of written stuff for the old eye holes. And of course, got all the radio for the ear holes. Got most of the holes covered. Can't account for all the rest. That's your own business. We'll take care of the major senses. You guys handle the rest. And, of course, you can always grab us live every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, via the old Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. Grab it, set it, and forget it. I think you're going to like it. Of course, however you listen live after the fact or whatever you like to do with the old program, make sure you hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom and goodness. We do, on occasion, enjoy hearing from you folks out there. <laughs> all right. And I'm getting all sorts of uh, TMI messages in the show chat, listeners. Good thing this is not a live video show. Probably would be disturbing to many of you. All right, let's keep on rolling. Let's see. Let's see who we've got disturbing me on the show today. Let's start off. He's already alluded to me as a Bond villain, so the show can only go downhill from there. We, of course, are joined by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. G. And how goes the ever shrinking ice rink? The ice rink is so. The I was outside today, literally just in a flannel shirt. It, it's springtime. Mud season is here. All of those winter fantasies that I had for two months—they're all gone now. It's. I'm getting ready for springtime. I'm glad you, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned the flannel shirt because I think that's required uniform in Maine, is it not? Don't they kick you out if you're not wearing the flannel? Yes, every, every male is required to own at least three flannel shirts in Maine. It's got to be flannel shirt and L.L. Bean boots. If you're not rocking that combo, I think you're, you're out, right? A year, well, you're, you're probably just wet and cold also. So those are two very important things to remember. There you go. Your two. feet are wet and you're unhappy. Two. Two important parts of the main uniform. Now that we've got that cleared up, let's also go to hopefully a warmer and less wet part of the hinterlands of Chicago. Good old St. Charles, Illinois, where we are joined by Uncle Mike Tussa from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, or should I say maybe someday down the road, Sir Mike. Haven't gotten there yet. Maybe someday. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, I've been nominated to be Sir Mike, and there, there's no other sirs here with any other nominations, so I'll take what I can get. No, great to be here. Exciting day today. <laughs> Weather is beautiful here in Saint, sunny, scenic St. Charles, uh, and uh, excited about the show today. I, I must admit, you do lead our, our coterie of knighthood nominations with one. So uh, there you go. Proud of place, sir. You, I can't take that away from you. What I can instead can do is keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. 
All right, let's get into it. What was trading? What was lighting up ye old markets today? And it wasn't another day. We've had a lot of days of maybe some vacillation trying to decide what this market wants to be. Does it want to be a sell-off? Does it want to be unsure? Does it want to rally towards a close, a sell-off? A lot of a lot of mixed messages going on. Nothing like that today. We got green pretty much across the board. Most of the major indices closing up 1% if not well north of that level. S&P up a little bit over 1%, uh, kind of up there in about the same percentage range as the NASDAQ. Uh, the Dow just leading the charge today, up about 1.5%. Correction, what correction? Pshaw, says the Dow today. Uh, all that green, of course, means uh, Bix Cash uh, blowing through the level I had thought for this time next week uh, for volatility views. But then again, we got another forward session, so we all know how things can progress. Last week was looking pretty good for me, so we'll see if I can if I can keep it up two weeks in a row. We're closing the day a little bit north of the 16 handle, right around 16, oh, 15 or so. So, of course, all of you were thinking, eh, it might break through 17 handle, but might drift around the 16 range. There you go. It's there. That's what I was feeling before later this week. So we shall see how long that comes, how, how quickly that comes to pass, really, and how, how things transpire out there. Of course, a lot of action across the board, kind of depending on where you're looking, a lot of action in the ball products and other fun stuff. So maybe let's start there, Mr. Rock Lobster. A lot of fun things going on today. Pick your poison. What caught your eye in today's activity, sir? Well, um, just about everything was green. Even GE was green when it was down below $14 today. Um, so what caught my eye is, once again, we've had a – one plus percent move in the SPX. Um, the VIX was not really able to get it closed below 16, first time in a couple weeks. Uh, it's hard for VIX to go a whole lot below 16 uh, if we keep rallying at, at this clip. Um, but almost every vol product we look at is the long vol products are having a hard time. Um, you might remember VXX was as much as fifty-five dollars not uh, not too long ago. I think what two weeks ago it's now thirty-eight. Um, SVXY <laughs> uh, just goes to show you they go down a lot faster than they go up. Those inverse fall products XIV is still dead. It will not it will not resurrect itself. Although I'm, it wouldn't surprise me if they did resurrect that product uh, down the road. Um, but SVXY is still alive. But it will take about four years to get back to where it was. So, um, uh, but uh, that trade now actually starts to look a lot better. Uh, SVXY is kind of that long short vol position, easier to hedge, and it's back in my wheelhouse for a hedged uh, position. So that'll be something we do in our vol newsletter this week. Um, but it is a it is a much more fun vehicle to trade at this level. Um, for people that you know like the short vol trade, it's more manageable, more hedgeable. Um, XIV, uh, we discussed this about a couple of weeks ago. Became when it gets really expensively priced, it's hard to trade it. You know, there's the downside in it was is too much really, and of course everybody knows that now. But um, it downs. It's hard to to kind of hedge it or turn it into a straddle or a strangle or kind of fun stuff like that. The way vol likes to move. But SVXY is there now. It almost it looks like a good buy ride, and you could buy, you know, a cheap VXX call um, call spread against your SVXY because you know percentage moves now on the downside um, are they're just not that big anymore for S SVXY. It, you know, a 10, 15 percent move in vol or 20 percent move in vol, it goes down a couple of bucks, but your any VXX call will really fly. So there's. There's things you can do with the product now to pair it off that makes it more fun. So I would say the vault products, again, are in fun land. Um, and there are interesting things to do with them because they're, they keep going up until they stop going up, and then they start going down again. So I can, we're, we are kind of in the going down again uh, part of the equation. So if you like trading these products, um, you will – probably find them a little more fun, possibly a little more directional. The only thing I would say that still gives me pause from going all really kind of all in, uh, but still leaning is which you're just, ah, we did. We had enough. Just we're the, the March future, it has three weeks to run still. It's just barely hovering above the cash, meaning 
we just keep rallying hard, and it's, the VIX cash is not really drifting down low enough to really put the hammer down on the vol products as much as um, they're definitely moving. Um, but there's more to go if VIX decides to take a look at 14 or something like that. You could see some, you know, you could see some ugly numbers. But other than that, everybody apparently thinks that this was all. Uh, I guess it's one of those things that I learned after a couple of crashes when I first started was ultimately people walk outside, see that the sun is still shining, and they go, well, maybe things are not as bad as we thought. The fact that um, the bonds have kind of stabilized here right around this 3 percentage range or close to it, and we see where we go from there. So at least for right now, that was uh, round one of the post-QE experience. And I guess as traders, we will know what round two looks like <laughs> when everybody freaks out about rates again. Um, I don't know if you remember, Mark, but in the mid 90s, remember when the Fed just did a surprise interest rate raise and it kind of shocked everybody? And oh, we yeah. Had that, sort of that was back in the days off. when, you know, uh, the Greenspan briefcase was uh, was de jure exactly. and imminent <laughs> and Fed, Fed announcements were imminent and measuring the width of Greenspan's briefcase was a, a cottage industry unto itself. Those days all exactly. seem like seem like silliness now. But who knows? With, given what the market responded to our new, our new Fed chief, uh, maybe those days are coming back. I don't know. I know. You you think about it. Oh, he's got he's got paper sticking out of his briefcase. Man, he must have really been in a he must have been in a real in a real pitch before he came out here. So, um, what I have noticed, I think that has been consistent, is the Fed has been remarkably quiet about this. They're like, sell off. We don't give a damn. Go ahead, uh, knock yourself out. So, just um, just on that score. Um, it's, you know, there's a little more volatility with interest rates moving. There's a little more volatility. It's probably better that they do, though, you know. Um, so anyway, that's what uh, that's what um, I, it looks it looks like we have that. Uh, another thing that's not hurting is I believe Apple made an all time high again. I'll save that for Tucson. But, you know, those those growth companies and enormous S&P 500 gains, um, earnings gains. Nobody thought there would be 27% year-over-year growth, but that's what you have. So, you know, who's going to take credit for it? I'm sure a couple people will, but um, that's what it is. Earnings grow and stocks go up, and that's where we are right now. So uh, it would not surprise me to see more of the same that happened today, tomorrow. It is kind of interesting that the Fed hasn't come out and – and said much about that. Just a demonstrable response from the market to uh, their fir first chairman's day in office. That said, it kind of was a little bit of a black guy, maybe for them too. So maybe they don't want to bring it up. Let's just let's just let's just all move past that uh, very quickly. But you do bring up SVXY and maybe how to trade it. That's going to be a topic we're going to get into a little bit later today. In fact, we asked you guys just a little bit before the show our question of the week this week. Something to mull over. As we keep on going, a lot of debate about SVXY these days. Will it survive? We asked you guys that a while ago. A lot of you came out, I think, actually on the no, it won't survive 2018. Uh, will, does it, is it poised for serious upside? All these things. We're going we're gonna to push those questions aside for now. Instead, we're just going to ask you, all of you out there who are slinging SVXY, I know there's quite a few of you, what is your vehicle of choice? We gave you some choices. Uh, I won't make you guys vote now. I'll let you, I'll let you mull it over for the mail block a little bit later. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike. But the choices we gave the guy, everybody, are naked long, the underlying, so get yourself a little bit long, SVXY. Uh, spoiler alert, not my favorite, but hey, your guys call. Uh, then you got long XVXY calls or call spreads, long puts or put spreads, or along the stock with a nice put hedge. Those are the four choices we gave you. Write in with your alternatives. You guys have already been writing in. Oh, well, Mr. Rock Lobster just mentioned one there as well. So a lot of different ways you could play this bad boy. I'm curious what you guys throw at us. Meanwhile, though, it's time for Uncle Mike to throw some stuff at us. Uncle Mike, sir, what caught your eye in today's activity, sir? <clears throat> well, uh, markets went up, and never before in the history of the entire month of February has there ever been a better time to sell than right now. Uh, it's an exciting day today. Uh, we had our pullback a couple weeks ago, and it looks like buyers have appeared to come in. Uh, what's uh, I've been kind of noticing the last few days is that uh, when buyers have come in during the day and then uh, we fade towards the end of the day, uh, it just seems like it. It, the feel of just the market in general is that people are just waiting for the second shoe to drop a lot of times. And uh, it doesn't look like it's uh, dropping anytime soon uh, from what's at least what's happened over the course of the last couple of days. Uh, we're still coming. We're still need to go up a little bit more 
Uh, we have roughly another 3% or so before we get to our all-time highs that we had on January 26th. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, for people that have uh, were able to buy a little bit more on the dip in general, uh, they should be doing some smiling right now overall. Uh, sectors that drove the markets today, we had the financials up 1.5%, technology up a little bit more than 1.5%. I'm referring to XLF and XLK. Uh, and the industrials uh, up just under 1.4%. So we had a lot of good things going on with the sectors uh, today, uh, the larger sectors anyway. Uh, and yes, the fruit company did make another new all-time high. Uh, that's an ex that's always an exciting thing uh, when you actually get to, oh, actually, no, it did not make a new all-time high. It came close to it, but it did not make the new all-time high. It was just under the all-time high. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it did have a very up day on the day today, up just under 2%. Uh, so that has to be a good thing. Uh, it's something Apple is kind of now more of like a, a growth stock uh, as opposed to just uh, the exciting stock that it once was that we talked about on the show years ago. But nonetheless, it's still a very good company, I believe. Uh, so a lot going on along those lines. And with just the uh, VIX cash down roughly 4% on the day, uh, for those of you that have some long calls, depending on when you got into them, they probably didn't get bit too badly today in terms of uh, volatility. So they probably held a lot of their uh, value with depending on what you held, of course. Uh, so basically, uh, it was an up day. It's a lot of fun when you have up days and uh, you're bullish. Go figure how that works, Uncle Mike. But yeah, of course, uh, our old friend, Mr. Buffett out there, giving a little shine, a little rub to, to Apple today, I guess, on an interview on CNBC today. Uh, he, they, you know, everyone has these newsletters tracking what Buffett does and trade what Buffett trades and all this kind of stuff. So everyone's looking to read the tea leaves with Buffett. And he came out and said, if you look at the recent purchases over the last year, we have bought more Apple than anything else. He also went on to say Apple has an extraordinary consumer franchise. And if you look at our holdings, you'd assume we like them in the order in which they rank by dollar value of holdings. But again, if you look at them in terms of recent purchases over the last year, he bought more Apple than anything else. So there, he went out of his way to give multiple plugs for Apple. So I don't know, Uncle Mike, you got your innovation index, but then we've got Fast Company probably angling for an exclusive given their most innovative company award to Apple. And now Mr. Buffett coming out here saying he loves himself some apples. So I don't know. Is that enough to sway you from the dark side, sir? Or are you still holding true to your uh, Uncle Mike Apple innovation index? Uh, yeah, I'm still holding true, but Apple is a good company. We still have it in a lot of our portfolios. Uh, is it uh, justified in doing what I did three or four years ago? Uh, no, I don't think it's at that level. And, you know, this Buffett guy, this guy's kind of a flash in the pan. I don't know if he's going to be around much long. I don't know if I think he's just going to kind of come and go, but uh, he's kind of a flash in the pan, if you ask me. I don't think he's really um, – he, he really doesn't have that long of a track record, I don't think. That's <laughs> Good, actually a good segue, Uncle Mike. Speaking of long-term track records and our friend Mr. Buffett, how often do we bring up Buffett on the show? And twice in one segment, which is, uh, this is a near-term record here for the option block. But our buddy over there, Mr. Rhodes at the SIBO, he likes to track all things Buffett's puts. And of course, uh, he infamously said many years ago that uh, puts and not puts in general, but also just derivatives were financial weapons of mass destruction. So as a result, his derivatives usage has always been watched with a lot of interest and a lot of irony in the world of options. Uh, we all know Mr. Buffett likes to blast away at some long term OTC European style index puts. Uh, and so uh, the folks over there at the CBO like to track them, see how they've done. And uh, it's an interesting chart. We got some notes uh, in the show notes. If you can see the charts for yourself. Uh, a lot of these puts uh, were sold back in the uh, frothy, you know, range of uh, back in between 2003 and 2007 or so. And again, there were longer term trades. Uh, we know that some of them were closed out in 2010. Uh, they profited about two hundred and twenty two million uh, at the time they had. Uh, let's see. So total all of this tracking of the positions, again, some of it, and the stuff that was closed out because the European, you may be wondering how they close them out early. It's because the holder, the issuer, actually asked to close some of those out, not Buffett. Uh, so they, they concurred with them and allowed them to take them off the books. Uh, but it looks like the remaining positions, uh, he's up about $2.3 billion with the B on those long-term puts. This is data going back to 2008 
when he was off about looks like about 5.3 billion on those uh so uh interesting stuff as obviously the sell-off making those puts a little bit rich and juicy uh post 2008 they've looked pretty good every year since then uh they except for 2011 they've had a pretty decent uh decent rally so there you go not bad, Mr. Rock Lobster. Sell some puts in a pocket about $2.3 billion, oh, about five or some odd years later. Is that, is that a trade you would make, sir? Yeah, I think, what did he sell? The, he sold the volatility. He, what, he sold long-term volatility at the top, which probably bought him the SPX for uh, $400. <laughs> and uh, not kidding either. That was because, remember, the low is 666, so God knows what puts he sold and for how much. So... Um, I think he was comfortable at owning it at that level. So, um, well, for a guy that never uses derivatives, he seems to use them, um, at really good times. I've noticed, uh, I remember I told the story on option pit on, uh, on option insider before, but I remember in 1991, um, somebody don't know who sold tens and tens and thousands of puts in Coca-Cola. Um, driving the volatility down to like i'm gonna say nine percent or something like that they literally bought more they just and um and aggressive puts like at the money near the money just out of the money um they sold as many puts as they could and then um and then i guess what was it um a couple years later uh lo and behold warren buffett has a massive stake in coca-cola <laughs> like i don't know how he got it i I know he single-handedly destroyed the volatility in um, late 91 and early 1992 in all the indexes because um, he sold the crap out of those puts um, and probably made another $10 billion doing that. So he certainly – and but he, he actually does one of my favorite things. You sell puts when the stock is already down. <laughs> I think that's the best way to sell them. Um, and you sell them when you want to take delivery of something. So he just waits until the stock is a really good bargain and the puts are expensive, and then he sells the crap out of them. So uh, take it from probably the best investor in history that you can sell puts. You just have to sell them when everybody else is too afraid to. <laughs> Yeah, that tends to work when you're lining up and, uh, and back in like, oh, 2008 time frame and, and Goldman's paying you a ton of money uh, extra above for premium just to have you uh, take these puts <laughs> uh, and sell these, take these puts off your hands. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a tempting trade. You get a nice little extra juice when you're Mr. Buffett selling these puts. Uh, but, yeah, interesting, interesting stuff there. The Coca stuff is kind of interesting. You know, we always hear about his index puts, not so much his uh, put blasting out in Coke which is, we all know, one of his favorite core holdings. A man likes himself some some sticky, uh, syrupy beverages. So <laughs> interesting stuff there. The earnings front, not a heck of a lot popping off after the bell here today. Uh, we've got Fitbit coming out, It's uh, but it's a $5.5 stock. So at that point, the stock is kind of like the option. If you want to take a flyer for earnings, which we all know earnings pretty much is, uh, then the stock <laughs> there are worse ways to go than the stock. Uh, but still, a lot of people were slinging some options on it today. This thing does about 9,000 contracts a day. Today, doing about 48,000 contracts out there. Pretty heavy. About 30,000 on the calls and about 19,000 on the puts. So about one and a half to one calls over puts. Looks like a lot of that activity is pretty much as you'd expect. Front month around at the money, or in this case, front week really around at the money, uh, where the lion's share of the activity was the five halves, the sixes, six halves, the four half puts, the five puts. All those strikes were pretty juicy and pretty active. You get a little bit farther out, not a lot. Except for the March, uh, March 6s doing about 3,000 contracts out there. So if you are out there slinging Fitbit, a few of those out there who like to trade options on some, uh, some cheapies, I know there's a lot of you out there who just won't touch it, won't do it if the stock's that cheap. I understand that too. Someone trading 100 lot of the Jan 2012s today out here in uh, Fitbit. Let's see if I, could, uh, if I could pull up those bad boys to see... Uh, looks like paper maybe sold them for 75 cents. So there you go, listeners. You want a covered call on for the 12 strike for a couple of years in uh, Fitbit. There you go. Nice 75 cents. Put it away for a couple of years, and you can see what you can get. Meanwhile, though, we're going to keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. (laughs) 
All right, welcome to the Odd Block. If you're asking yourself right now, self, is this the portion of the show where they talk about those crazy nut job Tesla puts? The answer to yourself is yes. <laughs> and uh, let's start off on the uh, the nearer term of those nut job puts, aka the 2019 Jan 50 puts, uh, which did some pretty decent action today. Even though Tesla was up about one and a half percent or another five handles. So all of you who were worried about it breaking the 300 handle level just a, just a little while ago, I know there are quite a few out there. You wrote to us, you were scared. You're writing puts at 300 level. We know who you are. Uh, today, not so much. 357, so you can take a nice little deep, uh, deep relaxing breath of relief and maybe adjust your push strikes accordingly. But out there on the long-term put front, the Jan 2019 50s doing about 261 contracts today, uh, still hovering right around close to 37,000, about 36.5 in terms of OI. It was over 37,000, came back a little bit. Now we're probably seeing some pile on again. And about 32 of the Jan 2020 50s, uh, OI creeping up out there, getting close to 8,000, getting up there to about where we're about 78.51 right now. So all these longer term puts that we kind of just came on our radar not that long ago have steadily and inexorably been growing in OI. They could perhaps rival the 2019 someday, but not as they say this day. Instead, we're going to keep on rolling on out to another name we talked about a lot on the on the old odd block. It's been a little while. Checking back in with them. These are our old friends at Dick's Sporting Goods. If you've been by a strip mall or pretty much any mall property in the U.S. these days, you've probably seen a couple of the things. You've probably seen a mattress firm. You've probably seen a Dick's. And uh, they were trading it up again today. Dick's, of course, sticker symbol DKS. Closing today right around 32 and a half, or off nearly 1% uh, intraday. This is the name that does, oh, let's see how many, of about seven, nearly 8,000 contracts a day. Today, doing a little bit more than that, to the tune of 180, almost 181,000. 165 to 1 puts over calls. Yes, of all those 180,000 contract listeners, only 1,000 of them were calls. The rest were puts, and 175,000 of them went up here. On the March 25 strike, looks like someone was was drawing, shall we say, a sizable line, perhaps even a trench, a Marianas trench here in the sand at the 25 strike. Uh, we saw someone just blasting away on these uh, bad boys pretty much all day long, uh, hitting the bid for a nickel. That's pretty much where the bid was, and they were hitting it. They said, you know, we want to sell some of these. We'll sell these for a nickel and a nickel more and a nickel more. Uh, so, uh, looks like these were just, uh, some, and the interesting thing too, is they went up in, in little, not little, but compared to the total volume, small chunks of 20,000, 15,000, 11,000, so on and so forth all day long until it added up to 175,000. Uh, it could have been someone coming in and, uh, looking to scoop these, but it seems like just the preponderance of it was, yeah, it looks like nickel bit at a dime most of the day and they were going up. Uh, at a nickel. Uh, no OI at all to speak of, so there's no closing out here or anything along those lines. This is like what appears to be size open in here on the 25 strike uh, for a nickel. I'm sure that's going to get Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, the risk manager in him, his blood just boiling. Let's look back before we get him on here for, for his anger and his outrage to see exactly what's been up in our old friend Dick's. It's been an interesting year for them. This time last year, they were hovering right around 50 bucks, so they were looking pretty good. And then they kind of got their wings clipped in their earnings back in May. They went from about 50 right down to about 40 and they pretty much were slowly drilling to the downside ever since. Got clipped again in earnings back in August uh, when they were already trading about half of where they were. They're trading about 25, and they could drop down. So they're trading about, yeah, in the 30s, mid 30s, dropped down to about 25. And they were kind of vacillating around that level for a while, slowly but surely. They've been climbing back up to where they are now, right around the 32 level. Mr. Rock Lobster, we got someone maybe looking at this chart and deciding 25 is my downside limit. Interestingly enough, though, you think if they were looking to acquire some stock, uh, maybe they, they would do it a little bit longer than these March contracts, which expire in, oh, 18 days, Mr. Rocklops. So let's, let's start with the broad view of you as a risk manager, someone coming in and blasting out 175,000 nickel puts. Let's start there, and then we'll drill down to the appropriateness, perhaps, of this as an entry point for dicks. Um, I, it seems like 25 is a great spot <laughs> to enter. Um, don't you find 173,000 contracts to be a, a pretty good size? That, that's, that's, that's decent size. You know, I wake up in the morning, I might sing a little bit more than that before I, I do my first cup of coffee, but that's not bad for the average person. 
I mean, the the <laughs> the low of the year is twenty over the last year is twenty four bucks. So, uh, you know, our our, th our our I guess earnings are coming out here relatively soon. Um, I think it's a latent cycle earning stock. So, um, it's a very interesting. Um, it is not uh, somebody is really. All I can say, somebody there paying a nickel on those, um, that is an, an enormous trade. So I don't know who sets the other side up, or that's, what, 175,000? So uh, what is that, seven, 17 million shares of stock? So somebody wants it. I mean, that's a good chunk of the float. So <laughs> that is um, an enormous, enormous, enormous trade, and it – the, well, the worst thing is, is if the person's right, who's not going to notice the 175,000 that went up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, the, that, that, the see <laughs> all of a sudden, don't you, be, don't you believe the blinky lights are going to be flashing on the uh, 175,000 lot <laughs> somewhere, somehow? Yeah, you know, this one, you're right. There is an earnings cycle in there. I think they're on the sixth, so it does come out. So there is a, a little bit of earnings boost. That's probably why he's getting that whole juicy nickel for those as opposed to uh, two cents or uh, or something along those lines. But still, yeah, interesting stuff. Clearly, our friend uh, doing a little bit of homework and deciding, you know, uh, 25. You're right. Entry point wise is not everything else aside. Entry point wise, not a bad entry point. Fit half of where the highs were this time last year. So you can certainly see some rationale from that perspective. Someone may be liking a little bit of retail, but not at these prices. But if it drops down, he'll be uh, he'll be happy to take it. If not, I'll take a nickel 175,000 times. Put that in your pipe and mull it over, listeners, as we move on to our next one. When would you like to blast out some nickel puts uh, a bit of a ways away and a bit of a ways out of the money? When was that, would that trade make sense to you or perhaps never? When would you never do that trade? Let us know your thoughts on that. Let's move on to another. Uh, it's been a while since we talked about this one. This was a frequent offender back in the day. Not so much these days. Uh, this is AIG, American International Group. Of course, everyone knows them. Uh, probably most infamously as the uh, the company whose, uh, shall we say, improper risk management kind of kicked off the whole 2007-2008 meltdown and led to the uh, myriad of unwindings and dissolutions of firms as a result. So, uh, yes, a little bit of infamy over there at AIG. These days they're hovering right around 59 bucks. They're actually off about one handle today, so almost 2%. They do about 12,000 contracts a day. Uh, today doing nearly 50,000, about 48, almost 49,000 going up out there. And a decent chunk of that, uh, let's see, a total of about 10,000 of that coming in. Looks like a bullish risk reversal out here in March. In particular, it was the March 57, 60 risk reversal. Uh, looks like paper coming in and uh, hitting, uh, hitting a bid on the puts or close to it for right around 50, 51 cents and coming in and lifting some offers on the 60 calls for 60 cents. So doing that for a nine cent outlay. That did that 2,500 times and they came back, did it again, 2,500 times more. A total of 10,000 on the puts. So they actually did it four times and 12,000 on the call. So actually a little bit of a ratio. So clearly if this is indeed uh, the old bullish risk, risk reversal, it appears to be then we got a little bit of a funky ratio of the upside. Obviously, they want this thing to uh, to pivot north and do so post haste. Also, it's like 2,000, 2,259 is going up. I don't think that wasn't a related trade in terms of time. Uh, could have come up later on and perhaps been uh, interesting, uh, but worthy of note. Also worthy of note, by the way, uh, that there is pretty much only 18 contracts open on the puts and only 6,000 open on the 60s. So clearly, this is opening paper. The 2x on the OI or for the versus the volume on the 60s is interesting, but it would be weird for someone to come in, perhaps flip the script uh, that aggressively, maybe turn 6,000 long into, <laughs> or 6,000 short into 12,000 long, flipping along those lines, or 6,000 net long. Uh, either way, that would be weird. So we'll keep it straightforward and just keep it as the old bullish risk reversal. Let's look into the chart here of our old friends AIG, see how they've been doing over the past year. It's kind of been a lot of peaks and valleys hovering around these levels here. They started off last year right around 63 bucks or so, got as high during earnings as about 67, yeah, about 67 or so back in July of last year. And then they kind of have, have troughed out a couple of times 
around 55, 57 or so in that range. And they kind of were bouncing around those levels again recently and then got back up to right where they are now, 59, 60 bucks. It's kind of been a lot of volatility in this name over the past year. Uh, if it is, as appears on the surface, our friend here wants uh, that trend to start moving in one direction, which is north and to do so pretty quickly. Given the fact that it sold off a buck, it was trading 60 bucks uh, just this morning, his strike selection perhaps isn't the craziest. Mr. Rock Lobster, what say you? I know you like a good bullish risk reversal. I don't know if you like uh, outlaying more, let alone doing it on a ratio, but what say you on uh, this fairly tight bullish risk reversal in AIG? You know, you look at this and you go, okay, it's, it's only costing a dime, um, but it looks like it's got a lot of leverage. So I, it doesn't look like a terrible one, but it's they just you know it's that I want to be long stock risk and I'm looking for earnings in AIG. I don't think they're in this cycle, so maybe just you know everybody's dipping their toe back in. It's like up, oh, we're not long enough. Time to get long because the market goes up and that's all it does. It it feels like it's um, it feels like that kind of a trade. So. Um, I just, I think a dime though off it, the leverage is really good. Although it's a lot of the 57 put, you know, it, somebody wants to own the stock. I guess that's the easiest way to put it on that one. So somebody definitely wants to own the stock in this one. You think so? You don't think there's positioning for a nice upside. They want, they actually want the stock, even though they're ratioed to the upside. Well, they, they've got to be, you, it's hard to sell a 57 put and not want the stock, you know, don't you think? It is a you're close, very you're, you're it's right. A, it's a close I mean, it's, to the fire type put. Yes, it is. The stock has not been below 59 in a year. So it's you know, I think they're looking at all those little those uh, pops when the insurance companies or when uh, some financial companies get hot. So I'm, I'm thinking they think this is a good spot. Um, but it it it's. It seems like they're looking at a chart and saying, well, this is what I want to try to maximize what we can gain on this. So um, that's that's what it appears to me on this one. Interesting. Let them know what it appears like to you. Do you like a good, I like a good bullish risk reversal. You guys like a good bullish risk reversal. Let us know when, why, how, what you like to do. I used to love doing them in Activision, not so much when it's at these lofty levels, but back when it was in like the mid-teens was one of the better ones, Microsoft. Well, not so much Microsoft. They're more of just a premium, right? You didn't really need the you didn't need the call leg out there. They weren't really doing much for a long time. These days, that script has changed a little bit, but back in the day, not so much. All right, moving on to our final name slash victim here in the old odd block. Uh, we got Regions Financial Corp. Another frequent offender. Haven't been back to this one in a while either. Uh, ticker symbol RF closing today, nineteen dollars and eighty cents, uh, up nearly one percent which is about 15 cents in this name. So there you go. Uh, the name it does, about a little bit shy of 8,000 contracts a day. Today, doing nearly 50,000, about 41 to 1 calls over puts. And that should tell you where our eye of Sauron was drawn. A lot of size call activity here in May and in March. In particular, we saw, oh, about uh, 12, 12, 13,000, actually, the March 20s going up. A lot of them going up in weird small lots, 300 here uh, for a little bit shy of 50 cents, somewhere on or around the bid, and then a couple hundred here and a couple hundred more there all day long for pretty much totaling a little bit over 13,000. A net OI in that strike, only about 8,800, so that is clearly open in there. Uh, but then we also saw a big chunk, uh, 24,500 to start the day of the May 21 calls going up, also right around the bid there for about 53 cents. Total of over 27, nearly 28,000 going up on the day on that strike. OI also only 1100 contracts a bit of an interesting funky month and or strike selection these trades went up a little bit different time so they weren't direct spreads uh, but it is worthy of note to have a lot of size apparently short call paper going up in uh, relatively in one session that doesn't do a lot of paper in general and on top of it to be so uh, unidirectional in its focus uh, interesting month selection march and then may uh, skipping the april sector apparently uh, that wasn't to their liking if it was indeed the same player on both and again both size opening let's take a look here at where rf has been see how this 21 strike looks and over the past year that kicked off the year at around 15 and it kind of vacillated there got down to about 13 and change back in midsummer. then it's kind of rallied pretty much to where it is right now it's been flirting with that uh, 20 handle 
ever so aggressively. I don't think it's crossed it this year as yet. It's gotten close. 1990, I think, is the high back early February. Uh, so it's flirted with the 20 handle. Hasn't really quite broken it. Mr. Rocklouse, or maybe our friends here decided to take advantage of that fact to draw some size upside lines in the sand, the scarier, the scarier lines in the sand than the downside ones. Uh, draw some size upside lines in the sand in uh, good old RF. What say you, sir? What are you feeling? These are naked. You feeling this is a this is a stock guy getting a bit of uh, spreading his yield out across the months. What 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 do you feel in your bones? I'm I'm feeling that somebody really wants the banks to go up and up and up. What do you think about this? They're going to write this stuff till the cows come home. What do you think about that? The March 20 calls, <laughs> look at where they trade today because it's much more than the open interest. So I, I still feel like this is kind of like bullish, bullish action overall. But am I crazy you, you, you or think what? Is this a stockholder overriding then, something like that? I, that's I'm, – I'm thinking, but um, – that's the only thing I could really think of because you know think about where these banks were a year ago. I mean, where do you think RF was a year ago? Ten bucks. RF one year ago was it was fourteen dollars. So I think I mean we just had that huge, you know, the huge trader. Even if they paid eighteen bucks for it uh, a couple of weeks ago, they're just that's some actual yield right there. Just saying. That is some actual yield. So you're going for the contrarian view that it is someone who wants this bad boy to rally home, in which case if they have a lot of underlying, I could certainly I could certainly feel what you're laying down. Kind of interesting. They would spread the yield out across the months. They don't want it all in March. They don't want it all in May. They want to spread them out a little bit, which is interesting in and of itself. So interesting for the size, interesting for the month selection and the strike selection as well. All sorts of interesting stuff going on there. Maybe we'll factor and, and file that one under the to be watched category here as well we'll come back to this one and see how our friend has done in his upside we got two lines in the sand downside and, and dicks upside in rf meanwhile though i talk about what you guys are up to because it's monday it's time for the mail block it's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails tweets Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Mail Block. And this is, of course, a portion of the show where you guys ask us lots of questions. We occasionally turn the tables on you guys, like we did last week. We asked you guys, hey, people are spooked about the market. Hedges flying left and right. So what are you guys up to in terms of hedging your portfolio? We know our audience kind of preaching to the choir. You guys like yourself some options, but we were... We kind of kept it open this time. We gave you a bunch of different choices. Maybe the more traditional portfolio hedge, a.k.a. the metals, your shiny stuff, your gold, your silvers, your whatnots. Or a little bit more hardcore getting into the volatility hedges. I use the term hedges in quotes there. Fix calls or pick your volatility product of choice. We didn't specify. We just said volatility. Uh, or the old traditional route of the index puts. A popular one probably with our audience. Or the last but not least, the quote-unquote non-correlated assets of Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, a third of you coming in saying you like yourself a nice, good old index put like a SPY or an SPX, something along those lines. You know what you're getting. You know your delta. You know exactly what you're paying for. You know what you're going to get. It's kind of a nice thing about that. It's like, you know, old pajamas. You know, you know what you're getting when you put those on. Same thing with nice SPY put. You know what you're getting there. Uh, then it was kind of a close dead heat for a second. Uh, just, shy, just quickly, shortly edging it out by a nose was Bitcoin with 23%. And then a tie for 22% with the volatility products like your VIX calls or metals uh, tying at 22%. So our audience is fairly split on this, which is kind of interesting. But the puts coming out on top. This week, we asked you, uh, the product Mr. Rock Lobster was alluding to earlier in the show. It's getting a lot of heat, a lot of action, a lot of interest. You guys have asked us about it a lot on the show. Uh, do we like it? Do we hate it? How should we trade it? So we thought we'd ask you guys. You know, a lot of debate about SVXY these days. Will it survive? Is it, is it the best trade in the world right now? Should you just load up on it whole hog as some people are, are trying to hit us up about? Uh, let's, let's just forget about that and let's just ask you, all you guys out there slinging SVXY, how are you doing it? What's your preferred MO? Gave you four choices. We encourage you to send in your choices, which some of you have already done. Uh, we gave you the choices of naked long SVXY. We've got uh, nice long SVXY calls or call spreads. So you want to get some upside. Uh, or long some puts or put spreads. Or you long the stock, but maybe with a nice tight put hedge in case uh, 
an XIV redux comes about here. <laughs> uh, so let's start with you, perhaps, Uncle Mike. Uh, what are your what are your thoughts here on the old SVXY? And then also, if you or if you how you have to pick what our listeners are up to. What, what do you think they're slinging these days in SVXY, sir? I guess if I had to trade it, I would pick a put spread. Um, but it's one to where it's such a foreign world to me. Uh, I choose to avoid it. Uh, and I would encourage our listeners to as well, unless they are option pit people who trade this stuff all the time, uh, that have an understanding of the product, but, uh, it's a, it's such a different world for me. I'll just say that I'm going to buy a small put spread and I will say our audience is going to do the same thing. Interesting. Mr. Rock Lops, I think you mentioned at the top of the show, you won't touch it unless you have some nice vxx in your back pocket is that the way you like to trade svxy and what are your thoughts i don't think we've we've touched on a little bit with you but have you had a chance to weigh in are you uh are you one of these ones out there who thinks this is like you know the best thing since sliced bread get long a ton of this thing are you one of these ones who's a little bit concerned about its health where do you fall on the immediate future of svxy um i just it's not going to go back to 150 anytime soon <laughs> that's number one um uh, I like the idea of uh, like buy rights in it, um, and you could hedge, but I think just the easiest way is just buy some call spreads um, at this level. So that would be the easiest way to trade it, um, just because of how where we are vol level wise. But it, it's not like something that's going to go from thirteen to forty five dollars in a month. It's just that's not going to happen. Um, but it, I think it's more at this point, it's going to be a you know, kind of what you saw today. Uh, the VIX is down, uh, you know, what, 80, 69 cents, and SVXY is up 47 cents. You know, it'll move on some delta to VIX. Um, and that's what it is. So it's just, it's, it's making its way. I mean, think of what XIV was like in 2011. I think XIV was, got down to $4 or $5. It didn't go out of business then. Um, uh, when we had some of those ball spikes. So SVXY is similar. It's kind of slowly grinding higher. And I think what you want is kind of a trade that will slowly grind higher with it. Um, that's, that's, um, anyway, that, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I actually went that way. I did a little bit of a call spreads in there recently, nothing crazy, a lot of silly flyers. Cause I still have a little bit of some concern. Some others have argued that this is uh, the time you should be loading up on this thing whole hog. Cause it survived the great XIV meltdown. So therefore it has proved its robust nature as a result. And of course, you know, we all know VIX coming off a little bit, so that should be favorable in the long term. But you're right, not going to exactly rock it back to the 100 levels it was at a few weeks ago. Uh, probably a little bit more. Those are a little bit more distant on the horizon. We had a nice little move today, given a little bit of a correlation move here to the sell-off we saw out there in VIX land. Still, those futures staying a little bit rich. Not going to get perhaps all the move we want, but still, it's been trading pretty actively today. Doing it's been averaging 51,000 today, 55,000, almost two to one calls over puts out there and our audience surprisingly actually uh, so far it's only been up for a couple hours you got the whole week so people can weigh in i'm sure these numbers will evolve but in the early voting 60 percent saying they're getting naked long the underline getting naked long some svxy so clearly they have not been dissuaded by the issues in this space if they see this as a nice long-term opportunity they're not scared at all uh 20 saying getting long the stock but with a nice put hedge so they have a little bit of concern, at least, and they're kind of worried about that. You know, There is that wild card out there. We don't know what regulatory shoe is going to drop on the space in the near future. I don't think we've seen the last of that. 15% uh, saying getting long some SVXY calls or spreads. They want to take a nice little flyer on the upside, but don't want to spend a heck of a lot. I certainly can see where you're coming from. And 5% going the Uncle Mike route of they want some downside. Again, you got a few days left to vote in this one. So get out there, add options. Make your voices heard, as I know a lot of you have. Oh, by the way, people are already sending in their alternatives. Uh, Vixland saying he likes tight covered calls. I could see that. You know, these uh, these calls are getting bit up. We saw, particularly in the immediate aftermath of XVXY, once you know, once the melt off was done, once it was clear that SVXY would live to fight another day, people were just piling into these calls left, right, and center. It was kind of a palooza. So you probably could have gotten some very attractive levels at that point. The vol has come in quite a bit since then, but it might still be attractive depending on where you're looking. Uh, I personally like the more of the verticals myself, but if you're into tight covered calls, 
I can maybe see why you might be attracted by some of these premium levels, even though it was a little bit more attractive, uh, let's say, a week, week and a half ago. That was when it was really, uh, really juicy. Uh, Mark Brandt listens a lot. He's chimed in saying, SVXY survived trial by fire and can be here. Here's another one. And can be declared robust. <laughs> Buying monthly to sell very juicy call. Here's another one chiming in on the covered calls. So people liking their um, covered calls. He also wants to know on the, on the SVXY front, he wants to know if we have discussed... Peter Thiel buying 240 million of SVXY puts days before the vol spike. He is smart, but that smells fishy. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to uh, to dig into uh, Silicon Valley VCs and their trading habits. Did this one come across your radar in the pit chat, Mr. Rock Lobster? No, I wish it did. <laughs> I know we did. We did have one client that had a hundred lot of SVXY puts. Uh, he sold out of them. One day before the vol drop, so he was. Oh my God! A little crushed. Do you have he him on suicide? Off, he made Do you have him on suicide them, watch right he, now? Is someone at his bed twenty four seven just to watch <laughs> over him? No, no. He he made money on them, just not a hundred dollars a contract <laughs> or a hundred ten dollars a contract. So, um, yeah, that was a little bit of a bummer for him, but it still was. Anyway, I thought I'd I'd share that it, we there was watching it, but not. Um, but it wasn't 240 million worth of SVXY puts. But we did have a couple of people looking at those things. I forgot to mention we had our your buddy, Mr. Rock Lobster, who sent in the picture of the Umbridge license plate in Vermont. He thought that was you. Uh, he wrote into the Vol Views last week, and he wanted to mention that. He was the guy who sent in the Vermont Umbridge license plate pics. I wanted to just pass that along to you. He's still listening, and uh, he's looking for your license plate. He's in the wrong state, though. I told him he needs to go to Maine and not to uh, Vermont. Then he could stalk you all he wants. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, <laughs> we've got uh, oh Mike, here's one for you here. We got that guy who was who was talking up his Facebook deep in the money calls. Uh, he followed up with more. Remember he wrote in kind of saying, What's up with all these Facebook five dollar calls? Uh, he did that probably a few weeks ago and he's been writing in steadily. He kind of ended up fessing up that he actually was the one trading them and that he was trying to leg into some sort of uh quasi box carry trades on these uh bad boys. He followed up with more saying because, Mike, I think you were asking what the heck was he actually up to. He says here, I'm not sure if this is the whole thing. Maybe he missed left some out. He says he did a net $431 outlay, uh, $430 for the covered spread, $1 for the put. He says he bought the put on the same strike to make $69.69 over 431, a.k.a. 16% less assignment fees. And he puts in parentheses, likely just a few in large blocks and commissions. So uh, 431 um, I thought it was a $175 spread he was doing. I'll have to go do the, to look at the strikes and do the numbers again. Though. But Uncle Mike, does that, does that clarify it for you? Or does that make it even more confusing? <laughs> no, it clarifies. And we've actually been in contact kind of offline of the show. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting thought that, uh, that he had come up with. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I enjoy trades like that, that, uh, you kind of wonder what on earth is someone doing with it? But, uh, you see what they're doing, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Ah, so you've been reaching out to this fellow and uh, sniffing around behind the scenes. Interesting. I like, I like our listeners when they give us crazy uh, ideas and feedback and what they're up to here. Uh, it's all sorts of fun stuff. Let's see. Um, got a bunch of stuff on uh, SVXY. <laughs> uh, Mardochi Pierre chiming in saying he, after the big sell-off in those products, he said they've been wait- he's been waiting for this day for a long time. Well, there you go. At least someone is happy on this. A lot of people weren't. I know Rock Lobster's, uh, Rock Lobster's client, uh, not uh, so much. I think we touched on this before. Um, Alonk, uh, I think we answered this. If not, we'll, we'll just answer it again really quickly. Um, he wants to know, what are the odds of a reverse split for SVXY? So he thinks, Mr. Rock Lobster, you know, the thing's down there. Kind of like VXX does. Once you get shy of 10, you know, you get, they got to reverse split it, right? So when should we expect, expect the oh, a nice 4 or 5 to 1 for SVXY? Get up to the nice 50 handle again that we can all wrap our head around. What do you think? <laughs> um, it'll, <laughs> it'll be, it'll, I think it'll be years. That's how it works, right? <laughs> that's how it's just reverse split and it's back up there. Yeah, well, no, S- SVXY is not going to reverse split it up there. VXX reverse splits it to get its price up. SVXY usually... Or historically, a split the other way uh, when it got too price too pricey and unwieldy, you know, it goes the other way. Yeah, Alonk, you've got your got your tickers confused. So VXX, which took a nice little drubbing today, all of you guys who've been loading up on VXX puts, 
I know Meatball and Sab and and, and uh, Rock Lobster, you guys have been doing that as well. Uh, had a little bit of a nice little boost today to that downside there. Uh, but yeah, so that one tends to do a nice four or five to one when it gets down in that uh, ten handle range. XIV, or excuse me, SVXY. Uh, not so much. Uh, Levi Music saying um, people want the X, the inverse vol space, I'm assuming he's talking about. They want it gone the same as cryptos. All they have to do is hold out the big money until XIV and SVXY goes away. He thinks the market will be down until then. Well, we've kind of rallied since then, so maybe not on the last point, but I could see maybe why you're feeling a little uh, a little tinfoil hatty about the inverse vol space. It certainly has been an interesting one of late. Not the last time we'll be talking about it. In fact, we got a question of the week on it, listeners. So head on over there, add options, let your voice be heard. If you got an interesting alternative suggestion, people like covered calls apparently out there in SVXY. If you got your own trade you like, some people like collars, some people like the Rock Lobster's flavor with a little VXX in your back pocket, let us know what you're doing. Meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling to our final segment. It is time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block. Like the man says, this is the portion of the show. We tell you what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week. We had Fit coming out uh, after the bell today. I didn't even get a chance to. Let's just, let's just pull them in. Pull them up for old uh, old time's sake. See how they're doing. I didn't even get a chance to pull up their straddle, but they're down 10% in the after hours. They close right around 550, and they're off right around 50 cents in the after hours. So all of you out there who've been um, on the long, slow death watch for Fitbit, product innovator, creator of a category, just like TiVo, now getting just nickel and dime to death by all the other competitors and entrance to that space. Certainly the numbers don't look good here, at least uh, today. You know, some people were saying their newest watch with some of the Pebble stuff in it. Kind of a little interesting. Uh, but apparently not enough to boost the market. Tomorrow we got uh, Square and Priceline after the close. I know some of you guys like to sling those. Uh, good old Papa John's. <laughs> apparently they have a, a premium pizza service that you can get yourself faster, but it doesn't impact the rest of the pizzas being made. Not sure how that magic works. But interesting stuff there. Uh, nonetheless, I uh, got the old Salesforce on Wednesday for all of you like to trade Trade CRM is the exciting world of that. Uh, Thursday, we've got VMware and Gap. And uh, Friday, you got good old Revlon and JCPenney. Good old JCPenney before the open. So kind of the dregs of the, uh, of, the, of the earnings world, but maybe some names out there. Etsy, perhaps some names out there you like. That's it. Let's go back around the horn. Uncle Mike, we'll start with you. What's on your Uncle Mike radar for the rest of the week? Well, we're only a few percentage points off the all-time high, and if we can get a little bit more of a rally, roughly a 3% rally by the end of this week, we're going to hit new all-time highs again. And I think we we might not necessarily get it this week, but I do th think that we are going to get it within the next few weeks at least, uh, worst-case scenario. And uh, I think that that's going to be a, a pretty important barrier, the all-time high, because it would be a classic type of a double top in that we hit the all-time high on January 26th, and then if we can't break through it again, then uh, it'd be kind of concerning to me personally, but uh, in the meantime, uh, let's rally this bad boy. All right, Mr. Rock Lobster, same thing for you. In addition to maybe keeping your SVXY puts on a day or two more, what else, what else are you keeping an eye on? Uh, definitely looking at how the vol, you know, looking at the opportunities for vol to VIX to get back into the 14. Um, so pricing things like that. And also the, I don't know if I'm, I'm looking at tech stocks, I'm looking at the QQQs and they are within 37 and 26 is what that is 63 cents. 63 cents of an all-time high, QQQ. So um, the the sell-off got us down to 150 and change, and they are back up like a rubber biscuit already. Um, so that opportunity to jump in and buy some is a uh, long past. So it was a great opportunity, and it is now – it is no longer there. So um, I still like uh, the Qs, although Amazon is in a in a in a, in a – category by itself but the fact that apple now is starting to get a little bit of an earnings uh multiple i find interesting but i i don't see it you know 
there still seems like there's room and the market wants him to go up. So just keep an eye on those Q stocks because they've been leading for quite a long time and it does not look like um, they are going to stop, stop anytime soon. Yeah, you know, uh, all that rebound should make the make the BTFD crowd very happy. I'll let you figure out what that acronym stands for. We're a family-friendly show, but they like to beat that drum quite a bit, and at least so far this year, <laughs> it's worked out for them. All right, that music means we have to come to a close on this ever-flowing journey down the river that is options. But before we go, let's go back around the horn one last time. Let's start with Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike, if I'm interested in, I don't know, ticket charges or skew or perhaps the price of tea in China... Where should I go? What should I do? Well, by all means, if you're interested in the tie of tea, price of tea in China, I'd recommend going to China. But if you're interested in skew or saving money on ticket charges or just working with a financial advisor who uh, gets excited when we have dips like we had a couple weeks ago and tries to find opportunities instead of being scared out of his wits, give me a call. 312-212-3531 or shoot me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. There you go. You throw Uncle Mac a curveball and he just rolls with Uncle. Unlike the Rock Lobster, if you ask him about verticals and expiration on puts in, in the SPX and it blows his mind. That said, Mr. Rock Lobster, what's, uh, what's going on? I hear you got a newsletter. Where can I go to check it out? Uh, yep. Vol newsletter. Go to optionpit.com and sign up for it. Um, uh, you can find out in all the all the stuff that you can sign up for, all the good newsletters that we have, and you'll do yourself some learning on Vol. So we have a couple of trades on right now, and uh, they are looking okay as things move, as the Vol moves down. They're starting to pick up that uh, short end of the side. So we'll see what happens. There you go. Check him out. His newsletter and his goodness letters over there. Optionpit.com. I like that. Goodness letters. I want to get some of those. Get some of that goodness. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike, and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing, sending in questions, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming. And we'll see you back here on Thursday for more of the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 